Can children be capable of such terrible crimes that they'd be tried as adults? The dark reality is that it has happened more times than you might think, and these dangerous kids couldn't hide their emotions when they received their severe sentences. Some cried while others put on a tough act. Today, we'll take a look at the 20 youngest convicts reacting to prison sentences. Roxana Sikorsky. Roxana Sikorsky's life took a turn from her early days in a Polish orphanage when she and her siblings were adopted by Lorene and Jeffrey Sikorsky and moved to the United States. Everything seemed great at first, and by 2014, Roxana had grown into a vibrant teenager known for her friendliness and intelligence. But then, everything changed. In 2014, when she was a teenager, Roxana met a guy named Michael Rivera on Facebook who was older than her. Concerned about their budding relationship, her adoptive parents stepped in, fearing that Michael might be manipulating their daughter. They confiscated Roxana's phone and forbade her from contacting Michael. Taking it a step further, they filed a statutory assault complaint against Rivera to protect their daughter. However, Roxana and Michael's relationship continued, and things got sinister in September 2014. Michael allegedly sent Roxana detailed instructions on how to harm her parents and siblings to help him get out of his legal troubles. The night of October 17, 2014, would prove fateful. Around 2 a.m., 15-year-old Roxana entered her younger brother's bedroom and made a horrifying attempt on his life by slashing his throat with a knife. Thankfully, the commotion roused her parents from their slumber, and they intervened just in time to prevent further harm. Roxana, filled with panic, fled the house with her boyfriend, setting off a manhunt. Now, during her court appearance, Roxana displayed genuine remorse, tearfully apologizing to her parents, saying, I promise that I will get better no matter what happens, through her tears. During the verdict, she cried quietly and covered her face as if to hide her shame, and despite her parents' pleas for leniency, the judge delivered a harsh verdict, sentencing Roxana to 10 to 20 years behind bars. Lionel Tate Imagine being the youngest kid in America sentenced to life in prison with no hope of getting out. That's Lionel Tate's story, though it took a twist later on. Lionel's childhood started with an unusual passion for WWE. He'd copy the uh, wrestling moves of his heroes and pretend he was right there in the ring. But there was more to Lionel. He had a knack for violence and aggression, earning a reputation as the school bully. On a fateful day, July 28, 1999, Tate was left alone with Tiffany Eunuch, a six-year-old girl under the care of Tate's mother, Kathleen Grosset Tate. A mere 45 minutes later, Tate rushed upstairs to inform his mother that Tiffany wasn't breathing. Initially, Tate's lawyer argued that the 12-year-old, weighing a staggering 165 pounds, had been merely playing with the 6-year-old girl, demonstrating professional wrestling moves. However, the truth was far more sinister. Tiffany had suffered a brutal beating, resulting in 35 injuries. In January 2001, at the age of 13, Tate was convicted of first-degree murder in connection with Tiffany Eunuch's death. The judge, Joel T. Lazarus of Broward County Circuit Court declared, The acts of Lionel Tate were not the playful acts of a child. The acts of Lionel Tate were cold, callous, and indescribably cruel. It was a damning statement, one that Lionel barely reacted to at first. And instead of showing remorse, Tate seemed to wallow in self-pity, shedding crocodile tears and seeking comfort from the adults in the courtroom. Now, despite many opportunities for a fresh start, Lionel Tate still found himself in legal trouble once more, eventually leading to his long-term incarceration for good. T.J. Lane in the quiet town of Chardon, Ohio, the unthinkable unfolded in 2012 when Thomas Michael Lane III, a.k.a. T.J. Lane, unleashed horror upon Chardon High School. His target? A romantic rival, or so he believed. T.J., described as a troubled kid, had intentions that ended in tragedy. Three students were killed and three wounded. Despite growing up in what seemed like an idyllic Midwest town, Thomas Michael Lane III's home life was far from happy, and this turbulent environment led to the loss of custody, with T.J. Lane sent to live with his grandparents. The nightmare struck on February 27, 2012, around 7.30 a.m. T.J. Lane stormed into the cafeteria where students gathered before their classes and opened fire. Five male students and one female student were shot before Lane fled the scene. T.J. Lane's trial proceeded as expected with a guilty plea on February 26, 2013. However, it was his reaction in the courtroom that shocked the nation. Lane entered the courtroom for his sentencing hearing, revealing a white T-shirt with killer handwritten across it. Throughout the hearing, he smiled and smirked wickedly, and after his sentencing, he delivered disgusting remarks to the victim's family, saying, This hand that pulled the trigger that killed your sons now m***s to the memory. 
fuck all of you while showing his middle finger to them. On March 19th, 2013, TJ Lane received three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Antonio Barbo. Back in September 2012, Barbara Olson, a defenseless elderly woman, was mercilessly subjected to a violent bludgeoning that resulted in her death. What was even more horrifying was that the perpetrators were none other than her own great-grandson, 13-year-old Antonio Barbo, and his close friend, Nathan Pape. When Barbara momentarily turned her back on the two kids, they attached her with a hammer and hatchet, and sadly their motive was shockingly selfish. They fled with a pitiful $155 stolen from the elderly lady they had just slaughtered. And what did they do with this small amount? They bought drugs and pizza. The gruesome details of Barbara's murder shocked the entire nation, as medical examiner Doug Kelly revealed that the old lady had suffered at least 27 blows from both sharp and blunt objects. In short, the brutality of the crime was beyond comprehension. Then in January 2013, Antonio entered a plea of not guilty by reason of mental defect, and two weeks later, Nathan followed suit with a similar plea. However, Judge Van Akron firmly disagreed with both defenses. He had seen a lot in his 24 years on the bench, but he considered this crime the worst he had ever encountered. I've not seen anything of this nature, not even close, he said. Now as the trial neared its conclusion, Antonio shed tears and asked for forgiveness, but his emotional display failed to sway the jury. Basically, he hardly looked as if he actually cared, but just wanted to escape his punishment. Barbeau attempted to read an apologetic statement but broke down in tears, passing it off to his defense attorney. He was ultimately sentenced to spend a minimum of 36 years in jail for the murder of his great-grandmother, John Freeman. In the peaceful town of Niagara Falls, John Freeman appeared to be an ordinary young man. However, in August 2012, at just 17 years old, John committed a crime that shook the community. He strangled five-year-old Isabella Tennant and disposed of her lifeless body in a garbage tote. The tragic incident took place at the little girl's great-grandparents' home, where Isabella had been spending the night while her mother was at work. The elderly couple entrusted Isabella's care to John, their seemingly friendly and caring neighbor, while they retired upstairs for the night. John had been left unsupervised with Isabella on on previous occasions, so it wasn't out of the ordinary. Police learned from Freeman that he had choked the innocent child because she wouldn't fall asleep. After taking Isabella's life, Freeman turned to a friend for help, 19-year-old Tyler Best, to help him hide the crime. When Isabella's family reported her missing after 12 agonizing hours, Tyler stepped forward and informed the authorities that his friend John had committed a horrific act. Best cooperated with the police and led them to the location where Isabella's lifeless body had been hidden in a garbage can. For John Freeman, justice came swiftly and hard. He was sentenced to 22 years to life in prison for his unforgivable crime. During his sentencing in Niagara County Court, Freeman broke down in tears and could only muster an inadequate apology. Through his tears and mumbling, he barely managed to say, I'm just sorry, I can't say anything else, as he faced the grieving relatives of Isabella, forever scarred by the tragedy he had inflicted. Mackenzie Sharilla in July 2022, 17-year-old Mackenzie Sharilla's life took a deeply troubling turn when she made a dreadful choice. One night, she deliberately crashed her Camry into a building near Cleveland, triggering a series of events that would take the lives of her boyfriend and his friend. During her murder trial, prosecutors painted a disturbing picture of her toxic relationship with her boyfriend, 20-year-old Dominic Russo. They argued that her obsession with ending the relationship drove her to intentionally slam her car into a wall at an astonishing 160 kilometers per hour. In her ruthless pursuit of revenge, Sharilla seemed to disregard the life of another innocent person in the car. It was Russo's friend, 19-year-old Davian Flanagan, who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Both young men lost their lives in the horrifying collision. While Sharilla ended up in the hospital, the judge delivered a stern verdict, describing Sharilla as hell on wheels. He pointed out her deliberate choice of a time with few witnesses and an unusual route she had explored just days before. Sharilla was handed two concurrent life sentences with the possibility of parole after 15 years at her sentencing hearing. During her trial, Sharilla chose not to testify, but her tearful reaction during the sentencing hearing revealed a chilling disconnect from her own vengeful actions. She started to cry relentlessly during the hearing, as if to soften the judge and jury, but she still stubbornly claimed not to remember her terrible actions that shattered the lives of two families. Caleb Sharp Caleb Sharp is known as the perpetrator of the tragedy that unfolded at Freeman School. On September 13, 2017, Sharp carried multiple weapons into his school and unleashed gunfire upon his classmates. This senseless act of violence took the life of young Sam Strawn and left three girls injured while putting countless others into a state of trauma and terror. Sharp's guilt was undeniable, leading him to plead guilty to premeditated murder and attempted murder. He was subsequently sentenced to 40 years to life behind bars. The courtroom was filled with people on that fateful day of his sentencing. Over 200 people shared impact statements, collectively urging Judge Michael Price to impose the harshest possible sentence on the young criminal. Despite the 
defense's plea for a 20-year sentence, the prosecution fought for at least 35 years to life. As closing statements echoed through the courtroom, Sharp broke his silence for the first time since his arrest five years prior. His words were filled with remorse as he addressed the entire community. I'm sorry to this entire community. I'm sorry to the people who can't sleep at night, he said, acknowledging the impact of his crime. Moreover, Sharp also said his apologies directly to his three wounded victims and to Amy Stran, the mother of 15-year-old Sam Stran, who tragically lost his life in the attack. Most of all, I'm sorry to Amy and Emily for taking Sam from them, he expressed with genuine regret. However, during the actual verdict, Sharp remained extremely blank-faced and unreactive as his sentence was handed down. He calmly accepted the consequences of his grave misdeeds without kicking up a fuss or crying. The Bever Brothers Children by nature are seen as innocent and pure. The idea of them committing serious crimes is something most of us find hard to grasp, yet it's a reality we must confront. Take the Baver brothers, for example. On July 22, 2015, 18-year-old Robert and 16-year-old Michael fatally stabbed their parents and three of their younger siblings in the dead of night. This nightmarish massacre, meticulously planned and executed, was not an isolated act of violence. Detectives later revealed that this nightmare was part of a sinister plan to commit more mass killings, and what was their twisted ambition to gain notoriety by outdoing previous mass killers. The consequences of their malevolent plot were devastating. Five innocent lives were snuffed out in a grisly familicide, and another was left severely injured, their 13-year-old sister, who bore witness to the unimaginable horrors and bravely testified against her older brother in court. Robert harbored a disturbing desire to become a famous serial killer, eventually pleading guilty to his charges in 2017. The brothers faced numerous charges, including five counts of first-degree murder and one count of assault with intent to kill. After the judge announced life imprisonment without parole, the older brother Robert seemed almost smug and happy as he smiled while being led away. On the other hand, the younger brother Michael seemed slightly distressed and shocked at receiving his prison sentence. Alex and Derek King. On November 26, 2001, two young brothers, 13-year-old Derek and 12-year-old Alex, used an aluminum baseball bat to brutally beat their father, Terry King, to death while he was sleeping. But their darkness didn't end there. They set fire to their family's home in a desperate attempt to hide their terror terrible crime. Their initial story to the police was a tangled web of lies. They claimed to have run away and hidden in the woods for two nights before reaching out to Terry King's friend, Rick Chavis, for help. However, the truth was uncovered. They had actually called Chavis shortly after the fire alarm alerted the police. Chavis, in a shocking twist, sheltered them in his home, leading to his conviction as an accessory to the murder. The brothers' motives were perplexing. They spoke of enduring what they called mental abuse, including being stared at and subjected to spankings. But their stories kept changing. First, they admitted to acting alone in the murder, then they claimed Cavus had manipulated them into killing their father. Finally, they accused Cavus of committing the murder himself while forcing them to take the blame. After the trials, Cavus was acquitted of involvement in the murder, while the two brothers pleaded guilty to third-degree murder in November 2002. Derek King received an eight-year prison sentence, and Alex was sentenced to seven years. In a surreal moment during their legal proceedings, Alex and Derek King didn't show any outward reaction to their sentence. Both children seemed eerily calm and content when the judge read the verdict out loud. In other words, they felt zero remorse for killing their own father, Philip Chisholm. At the tender age of 14, a ninth grader named Philip Chisholm committed an act so heinous it defies belief, targeting his 24-year-old math teacher, Colleen Ritzer. Back in October 2013, as the school day drew to a close, Chisholm followed Ritzer into a school restroom. Armed with a box cutter, he subjected her to a horrifying assault, ultimately taking her life. In a disturbing turn of events, he disposed of her body by rolling it into a garbage can and hiding it in the woods behind the school. Chisholm then happily continued with his day, heading into town to purchase a movie ticket using Ritzer's credit card. However, his actions hadn't gone unnoticed. He was taken to the local police station, where a search of his backpack yielded shocking evidence, Ritzer's purse and underwear, along with the box cutter smeared with dried blood. Court documents reveal a chilling exchange during questioning. When asked about the blood on the box cutter, Chisholm calmly responded, it's the girls. To the inquiry about Ritzer's whereabouts, his response was equally blood chilling. She's buried in the woods. Philip Chisholm faced justice as an adult, was indicted and tried accordingly. And on February 20th, 26, 2016, he was sentenced to a minimum of 40 years in prison. His mother, Diane, wept quietly during the sentencing, offering an apology to the Ritzer family for her son's unspeakable actions. But in a haunting contrast, Philip Chisholm stood before the judge with an emotionless blank expression, displaying no regret or shame for the consequences of his crime. Fernando Salgado 
In September 2012, the quiet city of Fontana was shaken by a shocking incident involving a local teen, Fernando Salgado, and what started as a guilty plea for assault with a deadly weapon uncovered a disturbing story of hazing at Fontana A.B. Miller High School, where Salgado was enrolled. According to the reports, Salgado faced accusations from not one, but two victims of this troubling hazing. Initially, he pleaded not guilty to attempted assault of his peers with a foreign object, a charge that carried the grim requirement of registering as a sex offender if convicted. But later, the prosecutors struck a deal with Salgado, agreeing to dismiss the serious charge in exchange for his testimony against a former teacher, Emmanuel De La Rosa, who was not only aware of these hazing incidents, but may have even participated in them along with Salgado and other three students. Of course, both students and teachers were accused of perpetrating one of the city's worst hazing incidents. During these legal proceedings, Salgado maintained his composure at first, pleading not guilty to all charges. However, when he learned that his bail was set at $300, thousand dollars his world crumbled. Salgado broke down in tears, struggling with court guards as he resisted returning to jail until his next hearing. He was led away, kicking and screaming in full view of his distraught family. Desperate cries of, get me out of here, get me out of here, echoed through the courtroom as Salgado begged to return home. Nehemiah Grigo. On January 19, 2013, five members of the Grigo family, including the parents and three young children, met a horrifying end in a mass shooting. What made it even more chilling was the identity of the perpetrator, their own 15-year-old eldest son, Nehemiah Griego. In a rampage that defies all logic, Nehemiah gunned down his family members with two different weapons. After the initial horror, he did the unthinkable. Reloading his assault rifles and stocking the family van with ammunition, he coldly planned to continue his shooting spree at a local Walmart. But fate had a different path in mind. Law enforcement swiftly took Nehemiah into custody, and what they uncovered during questioning was beyond disturbing. Nehemiah allegedly confessed with unsettling swiftness, offering a single motive for the killings. He was frustrated with his mother. Adding another layer of horror to this already tragic crime, Nehemiah had involved his young girlfriend, just 12 years old at the time. He allegedly sent her a photo of his mother after committing the gruesome act and confessed that part of his plan was to kill her family as well. Now what makes it even worse is that during his sentencing hearing, Nehemiah Grigo displayed a terrifying calmness and composure. His blank face and cold, hard eyes showed no remorse for the slaughter of his own flesh and blood. Dylan Shoemaker in a case of remarkable cruelty that shook. The foundations of all morality, 17-year-old Dylan Shoemaker found himself in the harsh glare of a courtroom in January 2014. The charge was the murder of Austin Smith, a toddler barely two years old and the son of his girlfriend. Dylan had been entrusted with the care of the innocent toddler and his infant brother while his girlfriend was at work. However, in a moment of unimaginable cruelty, Dylan muffled the child's cries with a pillow and struck him in a desperate attempt to silence the crying baby. Judge Baller remarked that by the age of six one can distinguish right from wrong. He underscored that Dylan Shoemaker was fully aware of the consequences of his actions when he struck that child. So the verdict was swift and unrelenting. Guilty. The sentence was equally severe, a 25-year prison term that reflected the gravity of his crime. As Dylan faced the consequences of his actions, he wept openly in the courtroom, claiming he had no intention to end Austin's life. But his loud crying failed to sway the judge or the public as many viewed Dylan's weeping as a calculated show and emotional manipulation. Damon Kemp a teenager, Damon Kemp, was found guilty of the brutal murders of Trey Ingraham and Jordan Payton, both aged 19, in December 2018. Ingraham and Payton shared an apartment complex in Daytona Beach, where Kemp was known to stay on occasion. Remarkably, both Ingraham and Kemp were former students at the same university. They appeared to be friends, and no apparent animosity had marred their relationship. However, tragedy struck when gunshots echoed through the apartment complex, leaving neighbors alarmed. The bodies of Ingraham and Payton were discovered 14 hours later. The shot Shocking discovery followed a confession by Damon Kemp himself. Kemp had run to a police officer investigating a home invasion at the Jade Park apartment homes, and there, he admitted to taking the lives of his friends. As the police arrived at Kemp's address, they found a bullet hole in the door and a shell casing on a nearby stairwell. Inside the apartment, the lifeless bodies of Ingram and Payton lay in cold silence. In no time, Kemp was convicted in May on two counts of second-degree murder and burglary of an occupied dwelling with assault or battery. During his court appearance, he displayed erratic behavior, appearing in a wheelchair and grimacing as if he were in terrible pain. However, the judge remained resolute, denying him a bond. As Kemp screamed and shouted, calling out God over and over, acting as if he was possessed, it became clear that his loud theatrics were not a product of mental illness or drugs, but a chilling betrayal that had shattered the lives of two innocent young men, a crime that he refused to show genuine remorse for, instead resorting to yelling in the courtroom. Shondell Jackson 
In 2010, 19-year-old Shondell Jackson was convicted of first-degree intentional homicide and robbery. Jackson's crimes revolved around the tragic murder of 21-year-old student Nathan Potter. On that fateful night, Jackson, accompanied by his friend, 20-year-old Derek Thomas, stalked Nathan, who had just left a local bar. Potter's life took a devastating turn when Jackson and Thomas accosted him. Demanding money from Potter, the situation escalated when Jackson discovered that Potter had no cash to offer. So he shot and killed the innocent student and fled to Mississippi. Ultimately, Jackson's own uncle played a role in bringing him to justice. The uncle, recognizing the gravity of his nephew's actions, tipped off the police regarding Jackson's whereabouts, leading to his eventual arrest. However, the horrors didn't end with Jackson's apprehension. During his trial, observers could witness Jackson's disturbing behavior as he made obscene gestures towards the victim's family and even smirked at them. And when the judge finally sentenced him to life in prison with no chance of parole, Jackson's true nature emerged once more. He grew violent, trying to look back at his victim's family angrily and fighting against the cops who tried to stop him. This prompted swift restraint from the officers present, including the use of pepper spray to subdue him. Austin Myers the unsettling events of January 28, 2014 in Waynesville, Ohio, tell a chilling story of a twisted friendship between Austin Gregory Myers and Timothy Mosley that resulted in the tragic death of 18-year-old Justin Back. The motive behind this horrifying crime was the friends' desire to steal a safe from Justin's family home. Myers and Back, the victim, weren't strangers. They had been childhood friends and even attended the same middle school. The sinister plan devised by Myers and Mosley Myers distracted Back while Mosley attacked the boy. The terrifying chain of events began when Myers knocked on Back's door, and Back, trusting his old friend, let them in. When Justin Back's life came to a tragic end, the two criminals scoured the house for the safe, eventually finding it hidden in a closet. After their dark deed, they tried to erase any evidence, but later returned to further ransack the house, stealing whatever they could find. The stark difference in their sentences caught a lot of media attention. Timothy Mosley, who used a knife to end Back's life, received a life sentence without parole, ensuring he'd never walk free again. Meanwhile, Austin Austin Myers faced a death sentence, becoming the youngest inmate on Ohio's death row. Now, Myers's lack of reaction to his sentence was disturbing, to say the least, as his face remained eerily devoid of emotion, resembling that of a heartless robot. Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire The creepy story of Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire, two 12-year-old girls, left the world shocked. They tried to harm their friend, all because of a made-up online horror character called Slenderman. The horrifying incident unfolded in a quiet, wooded area near Waukesha, Wisconsin, during a seemingly innocent game of hide-and-seek on May 31, 2014. In a shocking twist, Morgan and Anissa pinned down their unsuspecting friend, Peyton Isabella Leutner, by luring her into the woods. There, they committed an act of unspeakable violence by stabbing her a shocking 19 times, targeting her arms and legs, just to honor their favorite character, the Slender Man. After their awful attack, the girls told Peyton to lie down and wait for help, but they never came back. In a remarkable show of strength, Peyton left to fend for herself and managed to drag herself to a nearby road. A cyclist passed Passing by found her and immediately called 911 upon seeing her terrible injuries. Peyton's survival was nothing short of a miracle, given the brutality of the attack. Morgan and Anissa were ultimately found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, leading to their commitment to mental health institutions. After seven years, Anissa Wire got an early release, but she will be under supervision until she's 37. During the courtroom proceedings, both girls looked messy and filled with regret as they tearfully apologized for their actions, with Geyser openly crying and disbelieving belief at the verdict. Martise Fuller. The case of Martise Fuller unfolded in March, when a jury found the 15-year-old guilty of the shocking murder of his ex-girlfriend, Kaylee Juga, and the attempted murder of Kaylee's mother, Stephanie Juga. What led to this horrifying event was a deep-seated grudge. Prosecutors revealed that Fuller blamed Kaylee and her mother for his expulsion from school and removal from the football team. One day, Fuller seized the opportunity, sneaking into their home through the open garage. What followed was an act of sheer brutality. Kaylee, also also 15 and a high-achieving student at Bradford High School, was shot five times, losing her life at the scene. Stephanie, the mother, came face to face with him on the second floor of their home and was shot as she tried to hide. In a courtroom that must have been heavy with tension, Judge Mary K. Wagner handed down Fuller's sentence, life in prison without any possibility of supervised release for Kaylee's murder. During the proceedings, Fuller had a chance to address the court, but instead, a letter he had written was read by his defense co-counsel. And not only that, but he barely showed any reaction 
reaction to his sentence after the letter, leaving the courtroom with only a resigned look at the floor. Kyandria Cook Kyandria Cook's story became widely known in 2017 when a video of her sentencing went viral, capturing the heartbreaking moment when she broke down in tears and her mother wailed in the courtroom. The events leading to Kyandria's sentencing began when she became the face on a Meet Me app profile as part of a scheme in March 2017. The plan was to lure Perry Nita of Palm Coast into a meeting with the intention of robbing him. Nita, accompanied by his friend Emmanuel, Manny Purcell, agreed to meet in South Daytona. However, things took a sinister turn when Keandria then boyfriend and accomplice, Kendrick Bass, shot and seriously injured Purcell during the attempted carjacking. Just two days later, Keandria and Bass teamed up for another carjacking, according to police reports. At the time, Kyandria was a student at Mainland High School, and based on what her defense attorney had told her, she expected to receive probation during her sentencing in June 2017. However, these arguments fell on deaf ears as a judge rejected the motion to overturn her conviction and sentence and delivered a shocking 20-year prison sentence instead. At this point, the young girl's mother started to wail, which set off Kandria, leading to this emotional courtroom scene. Dexter Johnson Dexter Johnson's story is marred by a gruesome double murder that occurred in 2006, just days after he turned 18. Johnson and four other teenagers were involved in a carjacking and robbery that ended in the tragic deaths of 23-year-old Maria Aparece and 17-year-old Hui Ngo. The young couple was sitting in Aparice's car outside Ngo's house when they were ambushed. Court records reveal that Johnson and his accomplices abducted Aparice and Ngo, taking them to an isolated location. There, Johnson assaulted Aparice before he and another teenager teenager shot both victims. These murders were part of what state records describe as a 25-day crime spree during which five people lost their lives in a series of robberies. The courtroom erupted in pandemonium when Johnson was sentenced to death for his heinous crimes. Upon hearing the sentence, his mother cried out for him, making him panic too and react strongly to the verdict. In fact, he seemed to completely lose his mind as he attempted to jump over a desk and pounce on the victim's family. Luckily, the cops reacted in time and managed to restrain him, removing him from the court before he could cause more mayhem. So, how long do you guys think life sentences should be for kids? Let me know in the comments. If you want to see more content like this, click on one of the cards on your screen and I'll catch you there.